So good morning, everybody. Today, uh, we will have the talk by Dr. Anne Straume from ESA, from the Space Agency, uh, European Space Agency. And she will talk about the ambition uh, mission to Venus, discovering why our closest neighbor is so different. So uh, Dr. Anne Straume will be introduced by Dr. Francisco Gonzalez. Please, Francisco. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for coming to this seminar. So it's our pleasure to welcome Andrea Stroma from the European Space Agency, who will be talking to us about the uh, Envision, an exciting mission in which the AI is somehow involved. So Andrea Stroma, after her PhD in meteorology in 1998 at the University of Bergen in Norway, and then she has worked on several topics related to the Earth atmosphere, including pollution transport, the impact of changes in the ozone layer to the stratospheric dynamics, and satellite observations of greenhouse gases and atmospheric winds. She started to work at the European Space Agency in 2004 as project scientist for the ESA Doppler Wind LiDAR mission called AEROS. She also defined and supervised several studies in other science areas, among others, one on synergistic observations of methane and carbon monoxide on Earth and Mars. In January this year, she started as the project scientist of ESA's next mission to Venus and Vision. So the floor is to you. Thanks for all. So thank you very much for this very nice introduction. So indeed, uh, I'm the project uh, scientist for Envision, just started on this mission uh, early this year. And uh, the Envision mission is the first uh, mission to ESA from, uh, to Venus from ESA since about uh, 10 years. Um, and I will talk more about that later. Let me see if the button is working. It is not working. Okay. Looks like I can stick. Yes, it is working. Could you try to end with the I will try again. Yes, okay. it's working. Thank you, uh, Gabriela. So of course, I'm not working on this mission alone. Uh, in this slide, there are some uh, names on from our study science team and Gabriela Gili, who kindly invited me here and is working in your institute. She's one of the members of the science team for ESA. So these people are Venus experts and they're also uh, those that have, uh, at least some of them have proposed this mission to ESA. Uh, earlier, um, and then um, ESA has adopted uh, this uh, or has selected this mission now for study. Um, and uh, the adoption of this mission will come uh, in 2024. So um, these scientists are supporting the missions in different phases. We're now in the so called phase, uh, phase B1, where we look at the feasibility of the study, and you can see all the names of the co authors here. Also, in ESA, there is a big team of engineers. And uh, the names are shown here on the slide, uh, just some of them, these are just a few, but there are many more. And uh, the Envision mission is a mission uh, also in uh, close collaboration with NASA, who are providing uh, one of the instruments on board. And also mentioned in this slide are some of the names of the people at NASA who's working on this mission. And the last but not least, we also have the teams uh, in industry, and also the science teams in the different institutes, amongst others, also the IAH, who are working on developing the instruments and the spacecraft. So um, I'll first say a few uh, words about uh, Venus. Uh, probably many of you uh, know this before, but perhaps some of you uh, are not so familiar with the planet. So uh, Venus um, is an Earth-like planet. Uh, quite similar in size, um, and it is our nearest neighbor on the inner part uh, of the solar system, the inner part of, of uh, Earth. Um, its rotation period is, however, very slow. It's 243 Earth days, and it's also rotating in the uh, opposite direction of what Earth does, so backwards, if you say. So it's slower than uh, a Venus year, which is 225 Earth days. So it's, it's very different in that respect. Also, the surface pressure is very high. It's 90 bar compared to on Earth. You have a surface pressure of one bar. And also the temperature of the air close to the surface is uh, almost 470 degrees. So it's very hot on the surface. 
The atmosphere is not very hostile. Most of it is CO2, actually uh, about 97% of it. And uh, CO2, uh, as you probably know, is a very strong greenhouse gas. Uh, there is then uh, some amounts of nitrogen, and then on the sub percent level, you have different trace gases such as water vapor, SO2, uh, etc. What's also very striking about Venus is the massive cloud deck which is covering the, the planet. You can see that in this uh, image here on the on the right of Venus, and that cloud deck uh, is is very dense. So on the left hand side here. Uh, you can see an artist's impression of how it is on the on the surface of Venus. So it's uh, it's daylight there, but uh, uh, very little compared to on Earth. So it's uh, pretty gloomy, if you like. And this uh, cloud deck is having two functions. First of all, there is uh, less uh, solar light coming to the surface than on Earth, but it's also trapping uh, the uh, emitted radiation from the planet itself, which makes it such a hot environment. Also striking is the super rotation. So the, the winds on on, uh, on Venus, they're going in the uh, uh, in the east-west direction, are very very strong, and that's also very different circulation than you have on on Earth. So it's therefore challenging to to land something on the surface and, and Venus, and let alone to operate something there. It's hot. It's toxic. Uh, and also there is little sunlight, so that means that operating things like solar panels, like uh, the rovers on Mars are using, that's uh, virtually impossible, it's not very effective. But there has been uh, landers on Venus in the past. On the bottom here you can see uh, an image which was taken by the Venera 9 lander by the Soviet Union back in 1975. It was the first image of uh, the surface of Venus. Very spectacular and showing a, a very rocket, rugged planet. And uh, this mission could operate for uh, a few hours as long as the battery was lasting. So this mission used actually batteries to be able to operate on the surface. Also, Venus has no uh, moon and it has virtually no magnetic field, which is uh, then leading to it to be poorly protected from the solar winds. Uh, which are also eroding the atmosphere quite substantially. There are also no oceans on the surface, it's dry, uh, and there is low water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, however, there are a large variety of uh, terrains on, on Venus, including rifts and mountains, impact craters, uh, volcanic craters. Uh, here, this big image is a topography map from the NASA Magellan mission which was flying in, uh, from 1989 to 1994. And the colors here are indicating um, the altitude of the surface from uh, minus, two, uh, kilo or, uh, minus two kilometers up to 10 kilometer altitude. So it's quite uh, a high variety in the terrain uh, on the surface. And um, another uh, particular thing is that uh, the ratio in the atmosphere between deuterium and hydrogen is quite high and this uh, scientists believe are hints to that there may have been a, a strong water loss in the planet in the, in the previous or in the past during its history. And this is very interesting because that could indicate that maybe there was liquid water on the surface uh, before, or at least that the uh, planet may have had a, quite a different climate potentially in the past. So um, some of the th uh, things we don't know about Venus is how the interior of the planet is working. So there is a sketch here on the right, which shows uh, the core of the planet and uh, the magma and the uh, layers and the, the surface over here with the different features that you can find on the surface. Uh, so th things like the core size and the state of the core, it is most probably solid, but this is also not 100% certain. And also how the surface was formed and how old it is, these are questions that are still open for, for Venus. Earlier observations of the planet, uh, for instance from the NASA Magellan mission I showed you the, the topographic map of before, show that there are very few impact craters on the surface. 
Now that can maybe be explained by the fact that the surface, uh, sorry, the atmosphere is so dense, uh, but that's not enough. There are still fewer impact craters that we would expect from a planet uh, with such an atmosphere. Uh, there are also no signs of tectonics, plate tectonics. So it seems that Venus has uh, um, a pretty solid lid, which is uh, not uh, dynamic. And also the higher altitude uh, tessera regions are heavily deformed, however, by tectonic deformation. So the question is, how could they be so deformed? Uh, these high uh, lands that you show in the uh, that you saw in the figure before here with the color purple, the uh, purple colors, <laughs> sorry. Uh, whereas the, high, uh, the lowlands uh, seem to be quite, um, quite uh, uh, with very few tectonic features. So the hypothesis is that actually there have been some few catastrophic resurfacing events of Venus in the past. The last one uh, has been estimated to be less than a billion year ago. Uh, but the uh, big question is how come that these tessera, these higher elite regions, are then so deformed and show the uh, traces of, uh, of uh, tectonic activity? Also, a question is, as I mentioned before, has there been any water on the surface in the past? This figure is, is showing you um, on the um, vertical axis the uh, solar efficient uh, temperature. Sorry, I'm forgetting, I'm having two slides. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm reading on, on my screen. Um, so this figure shows you the vertical axis, the stellar effective temperature over here as a function of the distance from the star. And then you have uh, different exoplanets and how they are located with respect to the distance to the star and as a function of the star temperature. So you can see Earth up over here and Mars they're both within the so-called habitable zone, whereas Venus, which is on the inside uh, of Earth, closer to the sun, uh, is already in, in this arid hothouse region. Uh, however, in the distance past, the sun uh, was less bright than it is now. So uh, then Venus would, if you, if you like, would move closer down to the green area. So it could have been habitable potentially in the past. Um, and also has uh, liquid water on its surface. So there are uh, different models on how Venus has evolved through time. And for instance, there is a, it's a very nice in-depth paper by Sadek Jimman, who's been modeling different options for how Venus's evolution uh, was going through time. So one of the theories on how Venus become as it is today is the so-called dry Venus scenario. Here you have very high CO2 concentration forming after the magma ocean uh, was cooling down and you get the formation of the surface. And the high CO2 concentration, it's a strong greenhouse gas, then give you very high temperatures, which is causing the uh, water vapor, which comes from the volcanism to raise and then uh, water vapor is lost to space through a different uh, processes such as photo dissociation and uh, the other processing, uh, the reactions with the, with the strong solar winds. Um, another scenario is the wet Venus, which is shown over here. So perhaps a CO2 got trapped inside of the planet in the early phase, there was less CO2 after the planet formation and the formation of the surface. We had more uh, nitrogen concentrations and uh, water vapor from uh, volcanism could therefore have condensed on the surface because it was less hot. However, uh, at some point, the CO2 uh, levels may have rise or as the sun was becoming uh, brighter, there was an enhancement of the evaporation of the water vapor on the surface from the, from the potential oceans that would have been there. And water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas. It's very effective to store uh, energy in the, in the atmosphere. So this would have accelerated the heating up of the planet, the, the evaporations from the, the ocean, 
and the planet just gets hotter and hotter and hotter with time. And then it means that the planet cannot cool, it cannot radiate as much to space as it is heating from, from, uh, the, uh, um, from the atmosphere itself and from the surface, and you get the so-called runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, and that may have led to, uh, to uh, um, the water vapor in the atmosphere also uh, uh, going higher up in the atmosphere and getting lost to space by a different mechanism. So exactly whether Venus has developed via this dry Venus path or whether the wet Venus path, we don't know. The Earth has been moving towards this uh, path here because the Earth has a lot of uh, tectonic activity and is also further away from the sun. So here, uh, the formation of oceans was possible and we still have that as you know in the present day time. So um, another question is whether there are active volcanoes on Venus today. So uh, the very high concentrations or relatively high concentrations of SO2 in the atmosphere, it's higher concentrations in the Venus atmosphere in percentage than it is on Earth. And also the fact that we have a very massive cloud deck, which contains uh, sulfuric acid droplets, that probably could not have been uh, maintained if there was not active volcanoes on the surface. Uh, but it's uh, not been absolutely uh, certain that this is the case. So on the sketch here on the right, uh, you can see a little bit uh, of uh, a sketch of how volcanism can lead to uh, different sources of water vapor, SO2 and CO2 in the Venus atmosphere. So some of the water vapor uh, and also the CO2 gets trapped on the surface, goes down and gets trapped into the rocks and you have a cycling into the planet and out again from, from the surface processes how much that is and exactly the details on how that's happening. That's not absolutely clear. And that's one of the things that uh, the scientists would like to study also with the uh, Envision data. Part of the water vapor and also SO2 is believed to raise up and uh, feeding the, the cloud deck, which has, uh, as I was mentioning, the sulfuric acid droplets and high CO2 concentrations. And then the water vapor is also moving slowly up to the upper part of the atmosphere, where you have uh, the photo dissociation of water vapor and uh, escape of hydrogen. But in the past, there have been some indications that there may be active volcanoes also today. And uh, that was shown uh, by some measurements by the Isa Venus Express mission. This one was flying between 2006 and 2014 and measuring Venus um, in, uh, from an orbiting platform. So two of his, sorry, instruments, one being uh, the Virtus uh, instrument, um, uh, which was mapping the, um, the surface in the uh, near infrared, uh, because Venus has some, um, spectral windows in the near infrared, which makes the uh, thermal emission radiation to escape through certain wavelength. And this was uh, exploited by the Virtus mission, and they could make maps of the surface temperature from this. And here there is a, uh, some, some work from NASA JPL, which was correlating this thermal map with topography from the Magellan mission. And this is the uh, uh, Eden Mons volcano over here, and uh, in, in one shot or one measurement that they did over that one, they actually saw elevated temperatures over this uh, volcanic feature, which could indicate that it's maybe a volcanic eruption going on. However, Venus Express was only passing over this feature once and, uh, uh, and that had to do with the orbit it was having. So there is a, a, a one-off observation like this. So it's not the, the smoking gun for this. What was also seen by another instrument on Venus Express called SPICA, which was measuring SO2 concentrations above the clouds in the mesosphere, uh, was that uh, you had high variability in SO2 here on the vertical actions with respect to uh, the time here on the horizontal axis. 
So you had quite high variability in SO2 during the mission lifetime. Such variability had also been seen through earlier observations here in the 80s and also in the early 90s. Uh, and that could indicate either that the SO2 variability is triggered by the dynamics inside of the cloud deck and in the atmosphere, or perhaps uh, it could be an indication that there is a very variable volcanic activity down on the surface. However, how to link the surface uh, volcanic activities with the variabilities of the atmosphere, that's one of the science questions that are looked at by Envision. So here on this slide, I'm, I'm mentioning the main questions of Envision. So it's really to address the history of the planet, how the surface and, uh, and the uh, interior of the planet has evolved over time. It also wants to look at the activity, how geologically active Venus is, both when it comes to um, uh, tectonics, but also when it comes to volcanic activities. And it's addressing the climate of Venus to see how you can link geological processes with uh, variability of the atmosphere and also explain better the climate. So I mentioned some of the previous missions to Venus uh, before, but here are some more examples. On the uh, left here, uh, I mentioned the Mariner 2 mission, which was uh, making a flyby of Venus in 1962. This mission was uh, quite spectacular because it gave the first closer observations of the Venus atmosphere. And from these observations from, from uh, Mariner 2, it was possible to uh, determine the surface temperature, also the atmospheric pressure, and the fact that it has a very low magnetic field. On the right, you can see the uh, Venera 9 mission that I showed you the image of the surface from before. That was really spectacular, but it didn't only, of course, image the surface. It was also probing the atmosphere as it was descending through the clouds and below the clouds and was making uh, profiling both of the cloud and the atmosphere below. There have also been many other Venera missions in the 1970s and in the 1980s, and also the US have had uh, missions, uh, a series of missions called Pioneer. Um, then there is the Magellan mission, which I showed you some topographic maps of before, and that was also a very spectacular and a very big step forward for Venus science, because for the first time, the radar on board was uh, providing high resolution uh, radar images, which gave uh, surface topography information at the scale of uh, one to 200 meters for the first time. And you can see an image over here on the left-hand side, which shows you some of the features and uh, the differences in brightness temperature of the surface, which can tell you uh, about uh, the variability in the types of uh, surface material that you have. On the right, you have the, uh, the Venus Express mission from ESA that I uh, talked about before. And um, it was giving some evidence that there could be active uh, volcanoes, uh, perhaps on Venus today. But also another thing uh, that um, the thermal observations of the surface showed was that perhaps the planet's rotation is slowing down with time. So by uh, looking at the topography measured by Magellan in the 90s and matching that with the thermal maps also made from Venus Express, they were really looking at how the surface was moving with time and how fast it was spinning. So that's also uh, an open question, which uh, this uh, mission that we're uh, having now, the ambition mission, can help to address. Um, there is a mission at Venus right now, which is called Akatsuki, which was uh, starting its measurements in 2015. Um, this one is actually flying in a highly elliptic orbit and is um, looking at the clouds of the Venus cloud X, the upper cloud and the lower cloud using different spectral bands. And it's uh, used to get to track the, the movement of the clouds and to establish the meteorology of the planet. Um, it has been speculated whether, sorry, I have not switched, uh, 
swap the slide here, pardon for that, that some of the features seen by Akatsuki, um, because uh, Akatsuki has been seeing some dark features of different sizes, and particularly this narrow streak here, some people have speculated that maybe this is even a plume coming from a volcanic eruption on the ground, but it could also just be a dynamic boundary, which is causing this and causing variability in the thickness of the cloud deck. So these earlier missions, they have been addressing several of the science questions that are um, also questions for uh, envision, but they have not been able to answer them uh, fully. And therefore, it's a lot of room for not only for ambition, but also for many uh, missions to Venus in the future in order to home into these scientific questions and solve the riddles of the planet's evolution and also how it is working today. So coming to the mission itself, uh, the Envision mission has several payloads on board in order to address all of these different scientific areas. Um, as I was saying at the start, it's an ESA mission in partnership with NASA, where NASA is providing uh, the VENSAR mission, which is a synthetic aperture radar, uh, which will uh, be mapping the surface, uh, both uh, with stereo images to get topography, but it will also provide uh, brightness temperature measurements and uh, altimetry, and it's also a polarimetric radar. So it will be able to um, give some information about the surface properties and different uh, types of, uh, of surface material. On board is also a subsurface radar, which is provided by Italy, the SRS. And this is the first time such a system is going to be flown on, on Venus. It has been flown similar system before, for instance, on, on Mars. Uh, and this uh, will be probing the upper part of the crust of Venus down to a maximum of a thousand meters. Uh, and it will look for boundaries and stratification of the surface. It will also give some information of the, of the surface uh, structures. And we have a radio science experiment, which is provided by France with contributions also from Hungary. Uh, and this one will be used to do gravity observations and also to provide uh, observation in radio occultation using the communication system between the satellite and Earth. Uh, so it will probe the atmosphere and also tell about the gravity uh, variability of the planet. On the right hand here, we have a spectrometer suite called Venspec. It uh, contains three instruments, starting with the top one, Venspec H, provided by Belgium. It's a high resolution infrared spectrometer to um, um, map the chemical composition of the atmosphere below the cloud deck on the night side, but also will give some measurements above the cloud on the day side. And we have the Venspec U, it's an ultraviolet spectrometer, spectral imager from France. And then we have the Venspec M instrument, which is a near infrared mapping to look at the surface through the spectral windows of the, of the cloud and the atmosphere. And of course, we have also a, a Spanish contribution uh, to this mission. So your institute is giving the data handling use uh, unit, and you're also uh, involved in different parts of the work from the Venspec suite, suite also scientifically. So this instrument altogether, they're really uh, addressing Venus in a holistic approach. And this is the first time one mission is addressing all of these areas at the same time. From the inner core, the cross and the lithosphere and the mantle, which is done by the radio science experiments. Um, the morphology and the geology, which is being addressed by the Venzar instrument. The shallow uh, structures of the surface, which is addressed by the subsurface uh, radar sounder, and mesospheric gases, uh, volcanic gases, and atmospheric profiling done by the Venspec suite and also the radio science experiment. And then we have the mineralogy and volcanic activity expressed by Venspec M. This is showing you how. Um, Ambition is uh, flying. It's in a polar orbit. Um, 
on the right here, you can see a Mercator projection map of, uh, of the surface of Venus. So the, south, the North Pole and the South Pole are, are stretched here. Um, and you can see in the dark area, you have the nighttime and the lighter areas are showing you when you have the daytime. Um, so uh, basically the satellite is uh, moving from north to south at a bit higher inclination than what's shown in the sketch here on the right as an inclination of uh, 89 degrees. So inclination of zero degrees, that's close to the equator. Uh, the uh, pointer is not working that well. And if you have a 90 degrees inclination, you're really uh, um, flying from north to south over the, over the surface. The altitude of the satellite will be varying. So in some part of the orbit, it will be at 220 kilometers above the surface. And in, uh, in the opposite part, it will be at 510 kilometers. So it will be a lower in one part and higher on the other part. Exactly where the higher and the lower um, parts will be of the orbit, that's still being defined at the moment. So you can see here an example of the Venspec M measurements. Due to the Mercator uh, projection, it looks like it has a bigger boot footprint on the north and the south. That's not the case. It's the same all the time. It's just a projection. Um, and as this, the um, upper, uh, sorry, the planet below is rotating with every orbit, you get a shift of the orbit track going like this. And slowly you build up the measurements of the planet. So the uh, mission duration for uh, uh, and the mission is uh, six zero, Venus zero days. So that's about four Earth years. Coming to the individual payloads, this is an overview of the VENSAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar. It's an S-band radar operating at 3.2 gigahertz. And this will, will obtain images at a range of spatial resolution. On the right-hand side, you can see a, a table with the specifications of the radar. And on the left-hand side, you can see how the radar is measuring along the measurement track as it flies in this direction. Under the satellite, you can see this, the track of the satellite on the surface, and the radar will measure slightly off track um, and image uh, the surface. It will look at uh, and search for changes in the surface to look at uh, a, a potential um, uh, activity. Um, and it will do that by uh, doing uh, imagery of the surface at two resolutions, 30 meters, and also smaller parts of the uh, plant will even go down to smaller scales, 10 meters resolution. It will then provide surface topography maps using stereo radar imaging and globally with radar altimetry. And um, it will also characterize the surface by photometric reflections and emission properties using uh, both the SAR and the altimetry mode. Uh, it will not give a full global coverage um, because it's making these small uh, resolution observations. There is also not enough um, uh, data rate even to uh, have high resolution data down linked to Earth because there are also many other payloads on board that needs to use the radio communication. So uh, it will be a targeted mission. I've shown in the next slide, this is an example of possible targets that uh, the, um, the SAR will be looking at and not only the SAR, also some of the other instruments. So this uh, shows um, uh, possible regions covering tessera, craters, volcanoes, etc. And these will be uh, imaged in a nested way by using different image resolutions. Uh, also, uh, some of them will be um, um, measured in polarimetry mode and the rate of brightness temperature. And also, there will be thermal map mapping by uh, one of the uh, spectral mappers and also the subsurface radar. We'll be looking at these regions of interest in order to get a holistic view and really to, to um, understand what type of material uh, is uh, present on the surface. So this is an overview of the subsurface radar sounder. 
is operated at, um, at high frequency. It's lower than the, the star, but it's a so-called high frequency region at nine megahertz. And it will search for boundaries of material, as I mentioned before, such as impact craters and their possible infilling with time as you get the erosion of the planet and you get the infilling of the craters possible buried craters. It will also look at the tessera and their vertical structure and their buried edges. Uh, it will look at the plains and also um, look at lava flows and their edges. It also has a, an altimetry function, so it's less accurate than uh, the um, SAR, uh, but the um, subsurface sound that needs to know accurately the surface because you have effects called surface plotter where you get spurious reflections from the surface coming into the image and that needs to be corrected for so it's important for the the subsurface radar to have a good knowledge of the surface topography and it will penetrate the surface down to uh, a maximum of a thousand meters more typically uh, some hundred meters at a resolution of 20 meters Again, you can see the specifications of the system here on the right and how it is looking on the left hand side. Then we have the Venspec suite and we start with the Venspec M, which is a push through multispectral imager. Um, and it's operating in 14 near infrared transparency windows. So these are parts uh, where the thermal emission of the surface can escape through the atmosphere and <coughs> clouds. Um, so at the bottom here, you can see uh, which wavelength it is using. So these wavelengths over here of 0.86 uh, uh, micron up to 1 point, almost 2 micron, uh, will be used to determine the mineralogy of the surface. So depending on the, on, on the rock that you have on the surface, you will have different signal strength in the different windows, and they will have a different uh, signature spectrally. And that can be used to really uh, look at whether you're looking at basalt, rock, uh, other types of rock, and maybe even granites, which would have been an indication that there would have been water on the surface in the distant past. It also is using some windows to look at clouds and cloud variability, because the variability of the cloud, the cloud capacity, can also give you some experience variability of the surface signal, and that needs to be corrected for. And it also has a water uh, channel to see uh, the concentrations of water close to the surface, which is used for the correction of the mineralogy product. It can also be used by itself to determine how much water there is close to the surface. So the mission looks at surface composition. Uh, it uh, should uh, look for volcanic activity. So you saw the temperature. Um, uh, and the CBT maps uh, before from the from the Heritage Mission Virtus on Venus Express. And uh, hopefully we will be able to see such signatures again and to have revisit of those to get more conclusive results. The next one is the Venspec H, which is a high resolution spectrometer. It's uh, uh, looking in nadir towards the, uh, the atmosphere. And it's using it's uh, doing really high spectral resolution observations in the um, shortwave infrared. So the figure here shows you the wavelength range here at the bottom and the radiance on, on the vertical. And the upper graph here shows you uh, the sun reflected signal that you will uh, that the instrument will be uh, able to see on the day side of the planet. So it will only see down to the clouds. Uh, but the uh, atmospheric species of both the clouds that are absorbing and giving you these dips in the lines uh, will be able, uh, will be measured by the high spectral spectro resolution instrument in uh, different channels. As you can see here on the, uh, on the upper graph, on the upper part of the graph. It also looks at the night side of the thermal emission. So you have this very low much lower intensity thermal emission spectra here on the bottom uh, with different spectral windows, uh, which will be used to measure uh, SO2 water vapor and also HDO ratios and also minor trace gas species, which are related to uh, volcanism. These are the accuracies here below. 
There is also some heritage from this instrument, for instance, from the Venus Express Soir instrument. And uh, at the moment on Exum or STGO, there's the Nomad mission, which uh, some of you are working on. And that's also um, having a, a similar or having some heritage that are used again for the development of this Svenspec Edge instrument. The last Svenspec instrument is the Svenspec U, uh, looking at the ultraviolet. So it looks above the cloud deck uh, in a wavelength range from 190 nanometers over here up to about 380. At the lower part of the spectrum, it measures at very high spectral resolution in order to uh, get uh, measurements of SO and SO2. And whereas at the higher wavelengths, it is, has um, less spectral resolution. And here it wants to, uh, they want to measure SO2, but also the so-called unknown absorber. So the Venus cloud deck is absorbing more UV light than uh, what is expected from uh, the known composition of the clouds today, which is sulfuric acid droplets, SO2 concentrations. And the question is, what is this very strong absorbing substance? Um, and uh, the Venspec U in instrument will look into and try and hone in on that by measuring in the spectral range where this absorber is uh, active. So we'll map the upper clouds and also uh, give some information uh, on aerosol properties from these observations. And you can also get the uh, information cloud altitude. So then we come to the radio science experiment. So I was mentioning that before, it's using the radio link uh, between the spacecraft and the Earth to determine, first of all, the uh, Venus gravity field and the so-called K2 log number uh, to constrain the internal structure of the planet. So uh, the K2 uh, log number is telling you how the gravity field is reacting to uh, a body which is close by or circling the planet, such as a star or uh, a, a moon or a spacecraft. And uh, the lower the K2 number actually, it tells you about the um, consistency of the homogeneity of the, the, uh, the um, um, inner part of the planet. So if it's a low number, uh, you probably have a solid core. And uh, these observations will then be able to, to tell something about the inner structure of the planet. Also, you see here on the picture when the spacecraft is moving behind the planet, it can, uh, we can look at the bending uh, angle of the radio signal, and that will tell you about the temperature and the pressure com uh, composition of the atmosphere. And as it moves behind, you can look at it at a different level. We'll measure between uh, 35 and and um, uh, 90 kilometers actually. These parameters you can see over here. So you can get um, uh, sulfuric acid gas and liquid information and also uh, temperature and pressure information of the atmosphere. So um, the goal is really to look at the synergies, as I said before, to study the planet's history, activity and climate. And this is an, a, yet again another sketch showing you how the different instruments are addressing uh, the different application areas, gravity, geodesy, geology, and atmospheric chemistry, by measuring these different vertical scales uh, below the surface down to uh, 1,000 kilometers, and of course into the core up to 100 kilometers above the planet. But Envision will uh, not be the only mission in the 2030s actually uh, flying to Venus. Another mission was uh, selected almost at the same time at NASA, it's called Veritas. This is a slide from uh, Suze McCarr at uh, JPL, who's the PI of the Veritas mission. And this mission will have a radar on board called VSAR, it's operated in Xband. And it will use uh, INSAR capabilities to give very, um, uh, like a very good global coverage of topography on Venus down to 30 meter. So it's um, not going all the way down to uh, 10 meters, but they're coming close. And it will be very interesting to look at the synergy between 
the, uh, the Veritas topography that will be measured a couple of years before Envision will be there. Um, and also how uh, and the Envision topography maps to look at possible changes. On this platform, there is also an instrument called VAM, the Venus Emissivity Mapper. And this one is identical to our Venspec M instrument. So it will again look at surface uh, emissivity um, in order to look for clues of uh, active volcanism <coughs> and also to do um, investigations of the rock types. And it has also gravity science experiment. Another one, which is also very exciting, which is uh, measuring uh, or will be launched a year after um, Veritas. I forgot to say that Veritas should be launched in 2028. And Da Vinci uh, is scheduled to launch a year after. This is quite a different mission. It's, it's actually an ascending probe mission. <laughs> Uh, so it will be carried to Venus by a carrier, and then it will be dropped into the atmosphere, a bit similar to the early Venus missions in the 1970s and, and 80s, like the Venera mission. It will have an, a, a parachute, and then it will start to measure at 70 kilometers at altitude as it goes through the cloud deck, and it goes all the way down to the surface. And when it comes below the cloud deck, it will also do very detailed imaging of the landing site at different resolutions. So it will measure both uh, different uh, gases, uh, acid descents, uh, such as uh, noble gas measurements in particular. Uh, it will also do some an air infrared um, uh, imaging to look at rock formation and uh, have visual imaging. So that will be very exciting to see. This will be very accurate uh, measurements, but at one specific location. And then you have the global ambition and Veritas mission that will look at processes globally. There are also some other upcoming missions. One is from Israel, the, uh, the Indian uh, Space Agency, um, and they are um, <coughs> planning to uh, launch a mission called uh, Shukrayam. Uh, and they have had an announcement of opportunity that I'm sure several of you are aware of to um, to give the possibility for payloads from other countries also to be placed on this uh, platform. And the selection of these payloads uh, is ongoing right now. Hopefully we will know um, by the end of this year or soon at least um, what the final selection will be. And we know that uh, there have been some responses from, from Russia, France and Germany to this one for different instruments. Um, and it's expected to launch still in the 2020s, actually, so before the other missions. There is also the Chinese Voice mission uh, to study um, uh, Venus, and that will be uh, relatively similar to a mission and to the Veritas missions, more global missions with an orbiter. And uh, also it's uh, competing at the moment um, within the uh, third strategic priority program in China. And uh, uh, this proposal is led by the, the Chinese Academy of Science. And the selection of, uh, of the mis uh, missions to go forward in this program are expected to be also quite soon, uh, probably within this year. Um, they have a very ambitious uh, launch target, which is 2026. So that's actually uh, going to be pretty soon, should this uh, uh, mission be selected. There is also another proposal for a, a lander on the Russian side called Venera D. Uh, so, so that is actually having different mo modules, an orbiter, an aerial platform, uh, as you can see over here, and also a landing uh, module. And that's uh, uh, a slide lifted from a presentation from Roscosmos and, and Iki on this mission. So we're now really looking at the possibility to pave the way for a decade of Venus in the 2030s. And even before that, there will be several missions. And uh, people are working on Venus science are very happy about this because there have been many missions to Mars over the last couple of decades, I think around 30 or so. Whereas in Venus, there have only been a few. And we're happy to see that there is now uh, a number of Venus uh, missions in the making. And this uh, will be very complementary. 
For instance, we will be able to have, as I mentioned before, multi-year radar imaging to look at the surface and the topography in post-war change detection that will, we can compare them, the, the older Magellan uh, data sets with the Veritas and the Vision uh, data sets in the future. Also, there will be multi-year observations of the atmosphere, composition, and dynamics. And uh, this we have from the Venera and Pioneer missions in the 1970s and 80s. We have Venus Express, uh, Akatsuki mission, and also the future Da Vinci and Vision missions. So these really give you uh, a time span over many years, also giving different observations of the atmosphere. And then we have the gravity observations consolidating the models of the inner core of Venus and the planet's interior. And there are, of course, earlier missions such as the Pioneer Orbiter from, from NASA in the, in the late 1970s. Uh, these data sets can be compared with the radio science experiments on Magellan, Venus Express, and also the upcoming missions. But Envision will also have some first, uh, despite of all of these different missions coming up, it will be the first one to simultaneously, simultaneously sorry, study the Venus surface, interior, and atmosphere, as I said. The other missions uh, are not doing that so completely. Uh, perhaps the Chinese uh, voice mission will, but we will see uh, what comes out from, from their selection in the end. Uh, and perhaps also the Indian mission, we have to see also which payloads will go on there. It will, however, be the first one to do subsurface uh, sounding, and it will also go down to quite high resolution as a fine as 10 kilometer for certain regions of interest. Uh, it will be the first polarimetric radar imaging uh, the Venus surface. We have to see again if the voice mission will be selected and also do something similar, uh, but that's still to be confirmed. Also, it will give for the first time profiling of uh, sulfuric acid droplets. That's not been done before. And also do the synchronized search for organism. Um, and um, it will also be the, the first orbiter uh, with a dedicated search for, for uh, geological change. So coming at the end to, to the status. So, the mission was adopted, uh, sorry, was selected uh, last year and it will have a final adoption in 2024. The final concept will then be ready and uh, ESA will then have uh, an adoption phase to uh, really give the go, go ahead for the building of the hardware and the software and to develop it to be ready for launch in uh, late uh, 2031. Um, and it will also have launch opportunities every six months after that until May 2033, uh, should the first launch window not be uh, possible for, for some reason. The cruise phase of the spacecraft, so you can see the launch here, and it needs to cruise, of course, to go to Venus, will be about between half a year and one and a half year. That depends on the actual launch date and also the launching strategy, which is being uh, consolidated as we speak. Then there will be an air braking phase, so the spacecraft comes there and it will be in a highly elliptic orbit, and then it will use the Venus atmosphere uh, to break in order to come into the final orbit that we will have. Um, and the platform data will also be available for possible scientific investigation, and Gabriela and the room here is looking into that right uh, now at the moment to see what we can do with this data. And the, the mission uh, total uh, lifetime, as I mentioned before, is for Earth years, uh, but it could uh, possibly be longer as well if it would be extended. So the competing consortia right now, we have two industry consortia working on the platform concept uh, and the mission concept, and these are Airbus Defense in Space and Talas Alenia uh, in Italy. Airbus Defense in Space, uh, UK is the prime, and um, Italy for uh, Talas Alenia is the prime in the industry consortium side. So coming to the conclusions, Envision will be a dedicated study, uh, or will allow a dedicated study of the geological activity and history of uh, Venus, as I've told you today, and uh, its influence on the atmosphere, possibly also the other way around, the heavy atmosphere also 
working on the interiors of the platform and uh, of the panels. It's built on heritage missions from before. It also has some uh, novelties and it will be crucial for making a step forward in understanding um, uh, planets, not only in the solar system, but also beyond that. So it's very interesting to compare Mars, Earth and Venus and how they have developed differently in time. And in order to use that to understand how exoplanet system also are different and um, if they can be habitable. So as I said at the start, Envision will help us understand why our closest neighbor is so different. So with this, thank you for your attention. For you, very a complete presentation of Venus as an introduction and the possibility sense of opportunity we have in the next paper. Uh, take questions. I don't know if there are questions on Zoom. We can move it. Do you have questions? There is no question on Zoom by now, but uh, I will tell you. Uh, I have. Okay, Lisa. Yeah, hello, good morning. I'm in Lisa. I, I my camera because we have a big white background. Uh, it seems there are uh, very high resolution. Can you hear Lisa? We cannot hear now. Sorry? We cannot hear you very well, actually, at all. Okay. Now? Better? No. Hmm. Rene, can you talk? Yes, but uh, I cannot uh, hear Luisa either. The problem is in her, on her side. So. Yeah. Now? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm Luisa and uh, well, working at the Institute. I'm, I don't switch off my camera because I am with Wi Fi at home. Uh, the question is related to the spectrometers. Since you have very high resolution, or we have, or we are going to have very high spectral resolution spectrometers, when you measure any of the gases, can you constrain the isotopic ratios and saying something about the volcanic origin or? or the interior or the surface, or, or is not possible? I mean, you know, the point is, is there any isotopic ratio characteristic of volcanic eruptions that we can discriminate from what is, under, what is in the atmosphere? So I have to say that I'm probably too new to this in order to answer that question. To my knowledge, there is not. I mean, the gases that will be uh, measured in the spectral uh, bands is given over here and the spectral resolution will be quite high uh, but whether that can be determined uh, I'm not certain what uh, is certain is that uh, the instrument is sensitive to the lowest 15 kilometers for instance of the atmosphere and we'll be able to look at the trace gas concentrations really close to the surface so hopefully if you have uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, an eruption at the time it's flying. You can see the eruption in the Vensbeck M instrument. You can see also some signature back in the Vensbeck H <coughs> spectra. But uh, really to hone down on the, the processes for the surface, I'm, I, I cannot answer, uh, I'm afraid. I think not. Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that. Uh, oh, it's okay. Uh, <coughs> you can hear me. No, now that you're talking about all that points that my understanding of this issue is uh, kind of similar to what happens on Mars. Uh, one of the interesting uh, gases which uh, might demonstrate uh, kind of volcanic activity at present is SO2 because of these variations. So, because the isotopic abundances are very affected by the long term evolution of Venus at present. If there were any variation in time during the mission, one of them might indicate some refreshing, from, I mean, some fresh missions from below. So that might be one possibility to track the astrophysical abundances mm -hmm. and see variations on them during the mission, because that had to be from something a fresh source as my information. If nothing is obtained, it doesn't mean there are no sources, but if something is seen in that direction, it might be fixed. just because of the contrast to the current isotopic abundances, which only track a very long term margin. That's my understanding. So it, there is a possibility. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Great. Yeah.
Uh, well, some of the payload that Envision is going to have is similar to, uh, for example, the radar, the, the surface radar or the radio science instrument, is similar to some payload that is being used on Mars to study the ionosphere, for example. So are there plans to look at the ionosphere, even if it's not in the main goals of the mission? So what I've understood again, I'm not the expert here, is that this particular wavelength is not that sensitive to the ionosphere, and that's also in order to have good subsurface information due to the atmosphere on Venus being uh, much different, much denser than on Mars. However, what, uh, there, there are some investigations at the moment from the Italian team to see whether you can do some uh, science on the atmosphere with this instrument. And also they're looking into the possibility to perhaps detect uh, lightning from whistlers also, uh, but it's ongoing work. Uh, so to be in listening mode, uh, but it is not clear that uh, anything really substantial can be found uh, there yet. So it's under investigation. Thank you. And is there also a possibility with the radio application? Like, uh, there was a presentation by Sylvia Tamo mm -hmm. and CSC, and she proposed also to uh, measure our radiation density with some radio application. It was not one of the goal of the mission, but it's still on the table. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and what's important is anyway to do the ionospheric correction of the radio application signal. So they will start to measure just before entering the, the ionosphere and going behind it. So there will be protection of the ionosphere. So I'm expecting that this can be done as well. Mm -hmm. Any more question? Mm -hmm. Maybe could you please come closer? Just so I was just wondering about the ever breaking phase and um, <clears throat> well Europe has some experience with ever breaking with the express for example etc. And so I was wondering if, in addition to ambition, are there other missions from from the US uh, planning also breaking or not? And then in relation, yeah, they are right. Okay. Yes. So the very transmission, for example, that's going to have quite a low orbit. So that will be orbiting at uh, around, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, two hundred and fifty kilometer altitude or something thereabouts. Maybe it's written here. Um, and they will use aero braking as well in order to come down to that altitude and they will have a very circular orbit. So there will be also data from that mission as well on aero braking that will be used. Actually at the moment, ESA and NASA are discussing together a little bit the models of the atmosphere. <clears throat> ESA has had a study with LMD to extend uh, the uh, global circulation model that they have up to higher altitude so that they can do more precise calculations and preparations for the air braking, which is very delicate for the mission. And we're also discussing with NASA um, how they're doing that and, and the models that they're using for that. That's great. And in relation with that, it comes my attention that the, the orbit is not exactly circular, right? Exactly. So, it's... But why is that? Is any reason why? So um, you have different instruments on board with different requirements. Some will be closer to the atmosphere, some will be further away. And also like the radio science experiment, Venus Express was having a very elliptic orbit. So it was mostly the Southern Hemisphere observed. Now one would like to cover the Northern Hemisphere, but still have some variability in the altitude also for some of the payloads. So it's compromise as, as, uh, uh, and as well, we would like to have a longer mission lifetime than Veritas, so really four years instead of, I think it is uh, about two years for, for Veritas, normal time. By going a little bit higher in parts of the orbit, you can increase the lifetime with having less air or breaking by the atmosphere. So there are different reasons why it's slightly uh, elliptic, um, but yeah. Well, I, my last question or comment is that I'm so glad that the whole community that we are going to win it. <laughs> that we don't have any complaint, but if I had one, <laughs> if I had <laughs> that I don't, <laughs> I will say that what a bit that we go the last ones in the queue, no? because we are not, uh, we are arriving 2031 or something. No? And uh, so these synergies means that some of the stories may be done before by others, I don't know, but it doesn't matter because in the end also it has advantages. You can build up a 
long term mapping on Venus, which is good. Actually, if I had to choose from outside you regarding these uh, selfish European discoveries, <laughs> I would prefer to have missions which really track Venus for a long term as much as possible. So that is good in that sense. Mm -hmm. But and I wonder, question is, it's going to be really our overlapping emissions because that would be also very interesting. That would be very interesting. And if Veritas, for instance, has an extension, uh, then there could be some overlap with Envision and Veritas also provided that we go in the earlier launch date phases. Uh, that depends a bit on exactly how long emissions can last in their orbit. So that would be great to have at least overlap between these two. The other earlier missions by the Indians and the Chinese, I, I believe that these would be uh, finished before uh, Veritas is launching, but I don't have all the orbit parameters for these yet, so I, I can't really tell you exactly how they will fly, uh, but I'm expecting it will be similar to Veritas in the vision in, in one way or the other. So um, yes, it would have been nice to be faster. I think one of the challenges for Envision, it's a large mission with many instruments that need to be ready on time. And if you go for a smaller mission, or if you have much more money available, you can also go faster. So it's 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 a function of availability and complexity, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Can close here. Even if uh, maybe there are many more questions for Andre, we can ask her to us if you want to join us. <laughs> Let's thank Andre again for the nice overview. Thank you. Thank you.